I know what is good. That is, so the two words that we're looking at here today are uh, deontology and utilitarianism. All right, so let's go full screen here. All right, this doesn't go full screen when it's on the wiki. Doesn't matter. All right, so how do we know what is good? So there's a, this is a, actually a pretty interesting picture here. This is Jeremy Bentham in the Wax Museum. And at his feet, you can't see very well, but at his feet is his actual head that's been uh, preserved. So you've got to think that they really love the guy. It's kind of gross. Okay. So Jeremy Bentham, um, 18th century uh, philosopher who was pretty you know, controversial for his time, uh, is um, the, the guy who is the founder we can consider, well, you know, John Stuart Merrill, Jeremy Bentham, the founders of utilitarianism, right? And so this is a moral theory that says something is good if it produces a good consequence. So it's all about consequences. Sometimes this is even called consequentialism. But the real name of this moral theory is utilitarianism, right? And the idea is uh, that action which produces the greatest amount of happiness or the greatest amount of pleasure for the greatest amount of people is the action that we can consider good, right? So that's um, uh, a pretty sort of clear explanation. It was, in its day, a revolutionary kind of a moral theory because Bentham, as you know, proposed that we can actually calculate how an action was good or not. And we'll get to his calculator in a second. And so, for him, the greatest amount of happiness, well, what's happiness, right? That's that whole big question that we've been looking at. Um, so you've already seen what Aristotle uh, thought happiness was, and he claimed that ch children couldn't claim to be happy because you have to have lived a certain amount of time. Happiness is a sense of flourishing and satisfaction that you feel with your life after you've sort of accomplished a certain amount. So you have to have lived a certain amount in order to, to look backwards, right? That's happiness. So um, how did he get out of this whole problem of defining what happiness is? He says, easy. He's going the hedonistic, epicurean route, and he's saying happiness is pleasure. Guys, it's easy, right? We avoid the pain and we embrace the pleasure. That's what happiness is. Let's just keep it really simple, right? So, and he also proposed that you could measure pleasure and obviously you can measure pain. This idea here in his day was pretty revolutionary because nobody else was saying this. Um, but you know that, uh, well perhaps you don't know, um, 200 years later, Sigmund Freud, well, the quote unquote the father of psychology, um, pretty much all of his, uh, his uh, theory of psychology uh, can be summed up in uh, Bentham's idea of we go towards that which is pleasurable and we avoid that which is uh, painful, all right? And um, so then the next question is, well, what produces the greatest amount of happiness so that we know what we can aim at? And um, I just said this here that sometimes we call it consequentialism. We look at the consequences of our actions. We're not at all, in this theory, we are not considering your motivation. We're not considering what it was that you wanted to do or whether it was um, uh, your intentions. That just doesn't enter into the factor at all. So you could uh, do something absolutely horrific and it have uh, good consequences and according to utilitarianism, you could say, that was okay, that's a good action, we can accept that, that could be morally correct, okay? So you're going to see in a couple of minutes when we listen to this interview with Jeremy, uh, with um, Peter Singer some of the, uh, the limitations of this theory, because all theories have their limitations. So what does it mean to uh, the, this principle of utility? Well, it doesn't mean being useful, but it means um, producing happiness, producing pleasure, and producing well-being. So a good choice, a good action, is something that produces the greatest amount of happiness. That's the pleasure principle. Or here he has his, uh, his calculations. So um, how do we calculate a hedon, right? That's a unit of pleasure. 
So, well, look at all of these different criteria. We have intensity, duration, certainty, uh, nearness. That looks like an M, but it's actually N-E-A-R-N-E-S-S, -S, nearness, productivity, purity, and extent. Simple questions. <clears throat> the intensity. How much pleasure am I going to get? Is it a little bit pleasurable? Or is it like off the radar, oh my God, this is so wonderful, pleasurable? These are things that we can calculate. How long is it going to last? How sure am I that this pleasurable result is going to happen? Because if it's more, if it's very likely to happen, then if I have to sacrifice for it, if I have to wait for it, if I have to endure a certain amount of discomfort or even, you know, uh, pain for this great pleasure to happen, if I know it's going to be really great and I know it'll last a long time and I'm pretty sure it's going to happen, then I'll put out. And I'll do the work, and I'll sacrifice, and I'll wait, and I'll do all that stuff. Because what I'm really aiming at is pleasure. Yes? Is it how to measure pleasure? This is his pleasure calculator. Okay? Um, how soon will it happen? Because sometimes we want it to happen now, or tomorrow. We, w we don't want to wait six months. And human beings typically don't tend to think a lot of planning for the future. We tend to be biased towards the present. And so when we make a choice, we're really only thinking about right now. And this is something that is characteristic of the teenage brain. The teenage brain does not yet uh, have the circuitry in place uh, that allows it to very easily think long term into the future. It's just, it's all fuzzy. You can't even go there. All right, that might. Uh, offend some of you, but it's just a neurological fact. Up until about 22 or 23, some people are even saying 24 and 25, uh, your brain is not completely matured. And the parts of your brain that are still maturing is this prefrontal co cortex in the front here. And I'm touching my forehead and I'm telling you that this is the rational mind part here, folks, that Aristotle talked about. This is the reasoning part. And deep inside your mind, because I like to talk about the brain, I'm going to just do this quickly. If I take my, if I look at my thumb, if I take my thumb and I fold it into my hand and I fold my fingers over my thumb and I make the fist, that thumb on the inside is my amygdala. That's my limbic brain. That's my uh, old mammalian uh, 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 emotional brain that understands really intense, strong emotion. This part here, my fingers wrapped over top, is my rational thinking brain, my prefrontal cortex. And this part here needs to talk to this part here. This part's hugely strong, this limbic part. This rational mind matures slowly over time. So one of the things going on with teenagers, and one of the reasons why we know that they like to take risks is because they're listening to this part here. The, the thumb that's hidden on the inside, the limbic, the emotional part of the brain, right? And only with time are you better equipped to be able to use this rational mind and reason out your fears and talk yourself out of those strong emotions. Stoics, stoicism, okay? So um, how, do it, how productive is this pleasure going to be? Is it, am I going to get more pleasure? Am I going to get good things because of this? Um, purity. How, how much of this pleasure is only a result of having cultivated that or might be blended in and mixed with other pleasures? And the extent, how many other people will be benefiting from this pleasure? So can you think of your impending graduation in terms of this hedonistic calculator? You could. Let's take it through. Let's look at it. All right? So how pleasurable do you think that moment is going to be when you walk across the stage and grab your diploma and look out at the audience and get snapped by the photographer and there's the five years of your hard work coming to this culmination? You can maybe rate that on a scale of one to ten. You don't really know. You're going to have to live the experience, but in your imagination, you're thinking it's going to be pretty good. Right? How long is it going to last? <coughs> like the whole graduation process or just the process? The pleasure from having graduated. How long is that pleasure going to last? A couple of weeks. You want it to last as long as possible. You've got celebrations planned, parties planned. Right? Is it going to last longer than a couple of weeks? Is it going to last a couple of months? 
Is it going to last a year? In mid-July, are, are you still going to be feeling the pleasure of that, Ethan? Probably not. No, because you're going to be looking ahead. You're going to be looking at season, right? So it's not going to last all that long. How likely is this to occur? Pretty likely. Pretty likely. All right. What about this one? How soon it will happen? It's right around the corner. It's soon enough. It's not like you're in sec one looking at it in sec five. What about, will this pleasure generate more pleasure? Yes. Because then you get the pleasure of decision. So it generates pleasure in the sense that it generates other opportunities. Yeah. Okay. What about this one? You guys should be up here at the board. And your eyes should be at the board. What about this one? Is this pleasure mixed with other kinds of pleasure? Are there other things that contributed to this pleasure? Why? What, what other pleasures? How much is it mixed with the other? Well, I mean, Does it, is it, in other words, is it a standalone? Can this pleasure stand by itself? Or are there other pleasures that accompany it? Yeah, for sure. Like the pleasure that you get from social recognition. And it's not just about rewards for your hard work. All right? There are lots of other pleasures that are uh, that are surrounding that, right? The whole community applauds you. You get uh, presents. You get there's so it, there are other pleasures that are associated with it. And how many people are going to be benefiting from your graduation? Your parents are going to benefit. They're going to feel pleasure. Who else is going to feel pleasure? Your grandparents. So your immediate family. Who else? Your teachers, okay. Who else? Friends. 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 Okay, you guys, you need to think of your society. Does your society Government. benefit yes. because you have graduated from high school? Yes. Are you now more useful to your society? Yes. yes. So you have, you, all of you graduating have brought greater pleasure and greater happiness to this society as a result of your hard work. So think of it that way, okay? Good. So the good life is filled with pleasure. We know that. The Epicurean said that. Who said that? Give an example. What was his name? Zeno started it all. Zeno was the first Epicurean. All right. And then Epictetus. Is he an Epicurean or is he a Stoic? You guys need to review your notes. Epictetus is a Stoic. Epicurus is the Epicurean, right? And that's those are the hedonists. So the pursuit of pleasure, especially that of the physical senses, is a good in itself. Would Epicurus have agreed with this statement that the pursuit of pleasure, especially the physical senses, is a good in itself? Would he have agreed with that? No. Megan, would he have agreed with that? This statement up here. No. Why not? What might he have said instead? Or what part would he have disagreed with? Like pleasure is a way to get to the ultimate good, but it's not. Okay, so it's a means to the ultimate good, but what other kinds of pleasures did he say were supreme pleasures that he valued greatly? Tyler. Valued. Um, happinesses like that weren't uh, you can just get them naturally they weren't like so he, so he valued the pleasure that came from the natural world yeah. from nature okay so that's not necessarily a physical pleasure Marco what other pleasures did Epicurus value well, that were not purely physical I was going to say like he valued uh, his friendships and his relationships thank you life. those were emotional and intellectual pleasures all right and his physical pleasures were very, very simple pleasures. Good food could be very simple good food. Did he eat like only like bread or something like that? Well, he said when you're really hungry and really thirsty, simple bread and water is going to be a supreme pleasure. Yeah. Okay. So um, different versions of hedonism. You know, and you know that there's a continuum. We've talked about that. Mental pleasures, psychological pleasures, and even spiritual pleasures. And spiritual here, I think you should think of it in terms of the mind, as opposed to the religious idea of the soul. 
Uh, Epicurus valued long-term pleasures and pleasures of the mind as well, as we've just said. And John Stuart Mill, we looked at very briefly the other day. Uh, interesting little bit of uh, um, uh, information about John Stuart Mill. Uh, Jeremy Bentham and his father were good friends. So James Mill was his father. James Mill was also a philosopher, I think, and a jurist. And so uh, John here, when he was a, a, a little lad, uh, he was raised different. So today we might say, well, somebody's been homeschooled um, and they've been homeschooled by like really, really, really smart people. But um, John Stuart Mill was uh, uh, raised al almost as a, a social experiment. He was raised differently by his father and by uh, Jeremy Bentham. Uh, and he was brilliant. I mean, by, I think it's on the next slide here. Yeah, so he said he was a child prodigy. And by uh, six years old, he had read half of all of Plato's works. So let me tell you, you know, reading Plato was not easy. And reading Plato by the time that you're six, you've got some kind of an incredible mind there. At seven years old, he was editing his father's books. He becomes a member of parliament. And he championed women's rights. You remember yesterday the story I told you about his love, Harriet Taylor. And uh, they were uh, friends for many, many years. And when Harriet Taylor's husband passed away, they married. Um, and she edited and wrote with him his material. And he claims in his own writing, he says, you know, you really can't tell where the words are mine or where the words are my wife's because we're of one mind and we write together. And so you can understand that this man would then go on to champion women's rights which in his day and age was like completely unheard of. Well, no, not completely, but very, very, very unusual. And so his very famous book that you're going to probably hear in future humanities courses is going to be On Liberty. And this book is absolutely foundational for many of the constitutions that are alive and well today, certainly for the American one. All right, so they base their ideas of the freedom of the person, the, the, the right to life, liberty, and happiness, the right to happiness, that, what, what a concept, right? That's written right into their uh, American constitution. Those ideas come from John Stuart Mill, all right? Also, uh, the father of uh, liberalism, and not liberalism in the sense of liberal politics, but liberalism in the sense of uh, giving the human being the rights, the dignity, the status, uh, and the autonomy to uh, live his own life. So his big motto here is, I am my own man. And what are the implications of that statement, Daniel? What are the implications of that statement? I am my own man. If you can say that, or I am my own woman, or I am my own person. If you can say that, what are, what are you assuming about yourself? John. Well, but you're assuming that uh, I know what I'm going to say, but I can't worry. Just try. Just give it a stab. You know that it's the truth that you are you. Okay, so that's you're really that's what that's your that's your question. Yeah, yeah like that. that's really your, that's that's what you're all about. you got to figure that one out. So for you, it's true that, so you're, you're about that. But if, So if you are your own man, then uh, where does the responsibility for making you, you come from, John? Who's got the power to make you, you, if you can say that? Yourself. Yourself. That's it. So you're giving yourself power, autonomy, responsibility, all those things. Okay. So um, he, uh, so he, he was, you know, Jeremy Bentham was his tutor. Like that's huge, people. Okay, um, and he, and I love this that he disagreed with Bentham's hedonism, and he said that pleasures are on a hierarchy. Some are better than others, and that's important because let me go back to our calculator here for a second. Um, look, these are criteria. All right, and on this page here, are there some criteria that you think might be more important than others? Like, the, 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 how long the, the pleasure lasts? 
cannot be as important as how many people are benefiting. Given the parameters of my theory, all right, that the greatest amount of pleasure for the greatest amount of people, those are the parameters. That's what I've defined happiness to be. All right? If that's my definition of happiness, which one on this list should be more important than the others? The last one. How many people are going to benefit from this pleasure? So if we were to scale, give these you know, numbers here, this one should be at least double the other ones, correct? According to my theory, correct? So John Stewart Mill's contribution is, look, not all pleasures are equal, people. So, you know, it pleases you, it feels good to you, that's fine. But there's a larger world out there, right? And that the physical pleasure cannot be as important and valuable as a, a mental pleasure or as an emotional pleasure. Because the physical pleasure, you get it here, it's once, it's gone, and in 10 minutes, it's finished. It's done. But the one that gives you ongoing satisfaction and pride and sense of accomplishment and belonging and gives you your life a sense of purpose and meaning on all those wonderful things that we know we need, those things have to have a greater value than the physical pleasure. So Bentham was the greater hedonist. John Stuart Mill was not. Um, so there you go. So for, according to him, mental pleasures are at the top of the pyramid. The apex is the top. And ben, uh, Mill's famous question is, which is better? Given that there are different levels or values of pleasure, which is better? Would you rather be a happy pig? Or would you rather be a sad Socrates? And look at the difference here. So for him, the pig is the non-rational mind. Right, I've got all my, I'm rolling in my mud, I've got my stomach filled, I just have as much sex as I can handle, and I'm good to go. And Socrates here walked around barefoot, you know, practically no clothes. He, he, he ate when people gave him food. He, lit, he was a pauper, you know. Um, but uh, he had an amazing mind, and he was all about discovering other people's minds. Right? So he had all these tremendous pleasures, but he's sad. So the question that he would, uh, that Jer, uh, John Stuart Mill asked is, which would you rather be? Would you rather be a happy pig? Or would you rather be a sad Socrates? Anybody want to weigh in? Nobody, eh? What? Catherine. Well, I'd rather be a sad Socrates. Okay. Every year I say this. Every year I do this, or when I teach this course, um, there's always an interesting conversation about which which one would you rather be? And the last time I taught this, even before I got to the end of the slide, somebody jumped up and said, "Hands down, I want to be a I want to be a happy pig. Hands down. There's no contest in this. I'm I'll, I'm good with being a pig. I just want to be happy. Yes. The thing is that what do we mean by a sad? Um, uh... Well, happiness here in that's a good question. And happiness here is defined as pleasure. No, no, yeah, but we said it was uh, either a happy pig or a sad pig again. Socrates. Okay, but like what like, what is a sad Socrates is what I'm I'm asking. Okay. Like, okay, so the, the sad so the Socrates then would have a mental pleasure. So what he's, his question is going at is which pleasure do you want? Which pleasure do you value? Are you valuing the physical pleasures, in which, in which case you'd be fine with being a happy pig? Or are you valuing the intellectual and the rational, the mental pleasures, in which case, you know, the human, the human story is a whole, a whole big bunch of our life is sad. You know, we get sad. We suffer. We hurt. And we hurt emotionally. We hurt spiritually. And those hurts are deep. And sometimes they last a long time. Question? But, like, in my opinion, I'd rather be happy because I think ignorance is bliss and, like, just being happy. So. That's always the thank you. That's always the thing that comes up. Ignorance is bliss, miss. If I don't know about it, it's not going to hurt me. I'm good to go. Yeah. Yeah. So, there's, there's a great topic uh, of reflection for your next piece. What do you think about ignorance is bliss? Is ignorance bliss?
If I don't know about it, can I really hurt? Like so, so you know, my husband is fooling around, my wife is fooling around, uh, or I'm planning on fooling around, right? And as long as he or she doesn't know about it, it's okay because ignorance is bliss. If they find out about it, then they'll be hurt and they'll be devastated. But I'll make sure they don't find out about it. Yes. But the thing is that, like you said, that a sad. Um, yeah. Sad Socrates. Sad Socrates has mental pleasure, but yes. that's all he has. I like that's all. That's right. He doesn't have the physical stuff, right? Okay, but Socrates lived a life as a, 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 a pauper. Okay, but then the pig has everything. The pig has everything physical, but he doesn't have the intellectual pleasure. So John Stuart Mill's question is, which pleasure do you value more? That's what his question means. Okay. So the sad Socrates has. Um, all right, so let's go back up here. So his question is, is it better to be a happy pig or sad? Socrates expresses the idea that rational beings have greater value than non-rational ones, even if they're not happy. It also expresses the idea, as I just said, that mental, intellectual, spiritual, emotional pleasures are greater than the physical pleasures. All right? So uh, some pleasures are so valuable that a small amount of it makes it okay to be unhappy. So... Let's take the example of the Wick alum that came back to visit the other day, uh, Stephanie Frank, and she is working her butt off through university studying pharmacology. It's unbelievable how hard this young woman is working. I showed her the live scribe pen. I said, you need this pen. You need this pen. Bring this pen to your life. There's 600 kids that's in those classes. And let this pen help you, right? Um, and, you know, she, like... She said, Miss, if I take two hours off, I feel like I'm on vacation. It's unbelievable how hard I'm working. Why do people work that hard? Why are people sacrificing? Why are why why do we do that? Yeah. Well, I think that people do that because they know that in the end it will pay off and they feel that after they've worked and after they've accomplished whatever goal they want to accomplish, they'll be happy. But then there's the whole question of the calculation chart. How much is it going to pay off? Yeah. Right. And so when her calculations is going to pay off for a lifetime, because we're talking about setting ourselves up for a career, correct? Um, an action is deemed moral because it produces the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest amount of people. And uh, he said, you know, I'm this. we love this theory because it just seems to make so much sense. Like it's like a no-brainer, right? common moral sense. It seems really good, but there's a danger here that we might allow ourselves to do things that are really bad because we're sacrificing the rights and the happiness of a small group of people or animals for a larger group of people. And so how do we balance those numbers? Like, how little does the minority have to be for it to be okay for us to do that? The classic question is, is it okay to torture the one who you suspect of planting the bomb to get the answer to where is the bomb planted to save people in the building? So we're talking about the rights of one person versus the rights of everybody in that building. And let's even say that this person has self-proclaimed as a terrorist. You don't know if they're the one that's planted the bomb, but they self-proclaimed as a terrorist. Is it morally, morally acceptable to torture this person to get the information, to inflict that kind of horrific pain on them, to get the information of where's the bomb? So the greater question here is, what are those, what is that scale going to look like? And these are questions that are important political, legal questions. When we look at communities that have minorities in them, all right, how far do we go to accommodate this minority? The Muslim students want to pray at Concordia. They're asking for their own space. Concordia doesn't have space to give them. The Muslim students want a place to put down their carpet so that they can pray, because they pray five times a day. And one of the times that they pray happens to be like around lunch time. They want a place where they can pray. They don't want to have to do it in the stairwell. And people, this was a, a debate going on a couple of years ago, and some people were up in arms. Why should we give them the space to pray? Want to pray? Go home and pray. Pray uh, in your mosque. This is a, a public building. Why should we, uh, 
you know, but for that community, though that community of people, I mean, you know, the charter guarantees the freedom of expression and the right to practice your religion. So you've got important rights that have to be balanced here. Right? Um, and so, like, how big does that number have to be? Like, if there's only two students asking for that, maybe it's easy to brush them off. But what happens when it's 200? What happens when it's a quarter of the university? What happens when it's almost 50% of the population of that university? Well, realistically, that wouldn't even happen. Never mind whether it would happen or not. We're talking about hypotheticals. Oh, yeah, but... No, it's not about whether it would happen. It's about considering the question that John Stuart Mill is asking us is what do those numbers have to look like for us to be able to justify an action that might result in harming a minority? Those are important legal, political questions and social questions. Well, like, when, like, would you go on with like the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest amount of people so we might have to be like over 50% of the people? So then we're going to stick it at 50% of the 51%? Because that isn't the greatest number of people. So a simple number. That's so you get 51% of the vote that says we're going to separate from Canada and that's it, we're done, we're gone. See, like, that's, that's why I, like, I kind of have a hard time with the theory. Because like, just because it doesn't cause happiness for the greatest amount of people doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Ah, okay. All right. So act utilit- we're going to get act utilitarianism would sanction child slavery and every other abomination. So act utilitarianism, because there's two forms. One is rule utilitarianism, and this one here that we're looking at is called act. Act utilitarianism would say, you know what, uh, you know, it's okay, look, it's only kind of like 200 girls. Actually, it's more like 300 girls in Nigeria. I don't know why they reported 200, because I was reading yesterday, it's more like 300. So there are only 300 girls in Nigeria. I mean, uh, why should Canada get involved? You know, like uh, it's uh, too bad for them. We feel bad, but uh, uh, you know, how is that bringing great happiness to the Canadian people if we're going to send our troops there, right? I mean, how is you know us sending uh, uh, out to, to uh, Crimea and uh, um, you know what benefit are we getting the Canadian taxpayer? from getting involved in these uh, activities abroad. So you could say that, no, we're not getting any, so we're not going to get involved, and we could justify a whole bunch of things. Well, we do get pleasure from that, because then we feel like we're making a difference and that we're helping. So we do, in fact, get pleasure from helping others. Yes, we do. We get great moral satisfaction. And it is important. So. Um, 20th century philosophers developed what the other kind of utilitarianism called rule, and it's exactly to avoid these sort of moral dilemmas that we have with the act utilitarianism when we're wondering what was it, 49 percent, 50, 51, like how many, how many is is enough, right? So they set up rather than put the emphasis on the act itself, they put the emphasis on the rule, and so they say no one should do anything that they can't imagine asking anyone else to do which started to look a whole lot like deontology, which is that categorical imperative that we were talking about yesterday, when Immanuel Kant said that there are moral absolutes. Remember, I got you to think of your moral absolutes yesterday. There are moral absolutes. And if you can find it, then you're probably going to be okay with saying, I wouldn't do this, or I would do this, therefore nobody else should do this, or everybody else should do this. Right, so that's so they're they're trying to set up here the rule, right? So the the, the reason why we like utilitarianism is it because it offers uh, a moral theory that's much more flexible than the deontology. The deontology is there are moral absolutes, and you don't break them, and there are no situations where you could think of breaking that rule. Just not going to work. Right? We call them categorical imperatives. Yes. Yes. The weakness of this theory is that it doesn't really give us a satisfactory definition of happiness. Because happiness, ladies and gentlemen, has got to be more than pleasure. And if you're not sure, go back and look at that video that uh, where you learned about the ideas of virtues. 
uh, and what Aristotle had to say about happiness. Go back and look at that video with Matthew Hika when he talked about happiness, because he's talking about a spiritual happiness, an intellectual happiness, a psychological happiness. Right? We, it, it, it also doesn't say much for the rights of minorities, and it's really not good at measuring um, what that greatest good could be. So that's utilitarianism in a really quick nutshell. And Immanuel Kant, um, let me just go back here to John Stuart Mill. So, John Stuart Mill, 1806 to 1873, Immanuel Kant. 1724 to 1804. So if they are in, in rule utilitarianism, if they are making a reference to the rules, it's good to set up a rule and to follow it, that they're making a reference to these ideas that were already out there because of Immanuel Kant, all right? Because he precedes utilitarianism. And so he's in the same camp as Aristotle and Plato. Remember Plato talking about the world of forms? There are things that are eternal. There, you can point at the form of justice, the form of beauty, the form of truth that don't change. And it, so Kant is in that category and he does believe that you can look, you can point at something that is good, right and true, that it can be identified. You can find out what that thing is and it, when you find it out, then it is good for its own sake. It's not good because of the consequences that it brings. It's good because of what it is. So justice is always valued. Not because of the consequences of applying the law, but because it is good in its own sake. Truth. You know, when we had this conversation the other day about knockoffs and reproductions and fakes and stuff, and you all agreed that the real thing is better than the fake and the knockoff. Yeah, well, we get the fakes and the knockoffs because they're cheaper, but we appreciate the real thing. Why? Because there's a sense of we're not being duped. There's a sense of I, I own something that's a work of art. It's the real McCoy. It's, it's authentic. It's true. And we value truth. And even if you think you don't value truth, Ask yourself for a second, do you want your politicians to be liars? We know people are corrupt and we know people lie and break promises, but when we elect them into office, we want to believe that they are who they say they are. We don't, we don't want to believe that people are liars. We want them to be true. So there are things that are good for their own sake. And... Um, Immanuel Kant is the guy who comes along and says, if your intentions are good, 100% solely pure and good, then your act, even if it brings negative consequences, cannot be said to be immoral. Because what's most important is not the consequence, it's what you intended. It's your motivation. It was what you had in your heart and in your mind. So if the doctor, by doing action X, uh, produces a negative result for the patient, let's say the patient dies, according to Kant, we can't say that that action is a morally incorrect action because it produces a death, because that was not the doctor's intention. The doctor's intention was to save your life or to reduce your pain and suffering. And he gives you this drug, you're at the end of your life, you don't have much left to go, but he gives you a drug to reduce your pain and suffering, but the consequence of having been given that drug is that you died a week earlier or a month earlier than what might have been predicted. Can we take that doctor to court? Can we claim that that act is illegal and criminal and immoral, according to Kant? No, because that's not what the doctor's intentions were. Are you guys getting this? Yeah. All right. So huge difference. I mean, we're talking continuum. One over here, one over there. Right. So utilitarianism. The, only the actions count. Only the end result counts. Deontology, Immanuel Kant, categorical imperative. 
it's too bad if we get a negative, a negative consequence, but it's not the consequence that's important. It's the principle of the thing that's important. How many times have you heard a teacher or a parent say that to you? It's the principle of the thing. Have you heard that? Jackie, have you heard that? You want to give me an idea of, of a context in which you heard that? Like, if you say something, or if you, like, say something mean to one of your parents, and you're like, I didn't mean it like that, they can say, like, it was the fact that you said it. It's because you ha your intention was to hurt me, and you said that nasty thing, you know, because maybe, maybe you might have said it and maybe it didn't hurt me. But what hurts me more is what you had in your heart and your mind at the moment that you said that. Because your intention was to hurt. So it's the principle of the thing, right? Okay. So, Kant is all about duty. We have duties. And guess what, folks? We have duties to animals. And you read that in your text, right? Our duty to an animal is to protect it. Is to be, ironically, humane towards that animal. And if we're going to kill it and eat its flesh, kill it in the way that is most humane. And if we're going to kill it and eat its flesh, raise it and let it live in a way that it has the greatest amount of happiness and the least amount of suffering. All right? That would be Kant's position on animal rights. But it certainly would not be Peter Singer's position on animal rights. All right, so something that's categorical, if you make a categorical statement, just linguistically speaking, you're making a statement that's absolute. Okay? So if I say spring begins on June 21st, uh, summer begins on June 21st, that's a ca I've just made a categorical statement. That's an absolute statement. It's always true. Okay? When graduates are, uh, are always uh, the best and brightest of the West Island, I've just made a categorical statement. There's no qualifier for that. You can disagree with me. And an imperative is obviously, you know, it's a command, it's a duty. So if you have an absolute rule, you have to obey it. And here's the absolute rule. You've got to get this down in your notes. Act only according to the rule where you can at the same time will that it should be become a universal law of nature. Translated, what does that mean? Anything that you set up to be a categorical imperative has got to be something that can apply universally. It can't just be good for you and your friends. It's got to be good for everybody. So if you're going to say this is the rule, then it has to be a rule that you feel okay about applying universally. So yesterday some of you were talking about rape. You said rape is never permitted, it's never acceptable. So you would then, let's turn that around, and let's say it in a positive way. Human beings always need to be protected from sexual assault. The, 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 the security of the human person must always be paramount. Guess what? That's one of the, the rights in the Universal Charter of Human Rights, as declared by the UN in 1948. The security of the person. That's what that means. You should be able to walk through a field without having a, a, a mine blow up and take your leg off. You, your body should be secured against sexual assault and everything else, kidnapping and everything else. So Kant can say that's a categorical imperative. At all times, in all situations, we can set this up to be true. Are you good with me on that one? You, does anybody accept that that can be a categorical imperative? We always have to protect the right of the, the security of the person? Okay. Any situation. That's what it means to be uh, an, an imperative, a command duty, an absolute rule, universal law of nature. Because if you accept that, and if we write that in the universal charter, then you know what? No government and no state should be involved in capital punishment. Because if you put a prisoner to death, then you've just violated in the most extreme way the security of that person. Get that? So, Miss, what does that line mean? You mean you said only act for... Okay, this line means if you're going to say that X should be the rule, yeah. then it has to apply to everybody. It's got to be universalized. That's what categorical imperative means. Okay. It's going to be a rule that's going to apply to everybody, not just you. So it's not just about what, what you benefit. 
All right? So if you say telling a lie is the right thing to do, then you must agree that everybody else can also lie. Okay? If you're okay with lying, if you're saying lying is okay, and you you always say, well, it depends, isn't that? Then, then you have then you've got to relax and say, okay, well, you know, I, I'm 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 good with living in a world where people lie and everybody lies. And you know what? I'm going to teach that to my kids when I have kids. I'm not going to teach them to tell the truth. I'm going to teach them to be smart and know when to lie. So what are you going to teach your kids? Or are you going to teach your kids the moral principle of tell the truth? Aim at the truth. Always tell the truth. I have a feeling you're probably going to want to teach your kids that. Because they're going to learn the other one first. Or soon enough. Right? So always treat people as ends. And that means that they have innate dignity. And not as means. Objects to be used. This is Kantian theory. This is moral imperative. You never treat a person as an object. And this here is why I have a problem with pornography. Not why I have a problem with sex on the screen. Why I have a problem with pornography. Or any other uh, activity on this, and I'm talking about movies and screens right now, where a person is treated like they are a thing. This is why I can't go see movies about slavery. It just drives me, like 12 years a slave, I can't see that movie. I want to, I know I should. I can't, because it makes me sick. Those pictures, they stick in my head, and they stop me from sleeping. Because the person, you treat your animals, they treated their animals better than they treated their slaves. I can't handle that stuff. So, can't believe that people had to act according to the duties. We had duties, these are higher principles even when the consequences were negative. So tell the truth, even when you're going to lose face. Tell the truth, even when you're going to get into trouble. Tell the truth, even when your friend who you're protecting might get into trouble. And this theory ignores the consequences and focuses only on the duty. Can you imagine what kind of world we would live in, what kind of world this would be, if we had people who were leaving our world, who were, con who were not consequentialists, and who were deontologists. Ladies and gents, the people who wrote the, the Universal Charter in 1948, they were deontologists. They were not people who says, well, it depends. They were not relativists. They were not utilitarians. They were deontologists. The people who wrote the charter, the constitution of this country, who wrote right laws to protect your laws, your rights, are deontologists. They're not utilitarians. I'll get you in a second, uh, Mark Anthony. So, um, this is the strength of this theory. It is impartial. It doesn't play favorites. We don't say, well, I like you, you're white, you're rich, you can have all the rights you want. It puts the emphasis on intentions, on values, on virtues, on moral principles despite the fact that it might bring a negative outcome. And the big criticism of this theory is that it's way too rigid. Because sometimes you've got to lie, sometimes you've got to steal, or I don't know, do you? Or can you live a life the way Immanuel Kant wanted to live? And so do you know which is the right path? I know you have a feeling in your guts what is right. I know you do. We all have that feeling. And interestingly enough, there is a connection between your guts, your actual real intestines, your actual real guts, and the moral, the emotional part of your brain. Did you know that? Think of that. When people, or my brother's like this, when he gets upset, he gets such stomach pain. Me too. When his emotions go nuts, he, he hurts here so much, that's because there's a connection between your intestines and that emotional thing in your brain that I was telling you about a while ago. So what does that mean for our moral intuitions? I think we all have them. I think we all instinctively in our guts know what we think is right. And I think we always feel pulled between utilitarianism, right? Because it just makes sense, makes a lot of good common sense, and doing the right thing, which is really hard. Aiming at the principle. Marco shakes his head and he says, no, miss, I have no problem. No, because like, 
we just saw that um, deontology it just focuses on duties and ignores the consequences. So if like if duties outweigh the con the consequences, then so many like so so much more bad things will like can end up happening. I don't know. That's how I see it. Yeah, that's exactly perfect. That's wonderful because that's exactly the criticism. It makes no sense. 